All right, hello everybody. We are back for part two of the lecture on signal detection theory. And when we left off, we were looking at this slide. You can see all the little animations on it. Maybe I can just load it up. Uh, where we had um, basically laid out our assumptions for what's going on sort of behind the scenes of, in a detection experiment where you're trying to identify whether you hear or not identify, but detect whether or not there's a signal and some noise being played to you. So sometimes there's just noise. Sometimes there's actually a signal there. And what happens is that uh, when you hear a signal, there's more evidence that there's a signal uh, than when there is just noise. Uh, and that depends on what's out there in the stimulus itself. And on top of that, you sort of overlay this criterion, uh, which is this um, line in the sand that you draw basically in, on the perceptual evidence dimension. And you say, anytime I hear more evidence than that, I will respond present uh, that there is a signal in the signal. And then if you hear less evidence than that, then you will say, no, there's nothing there. Uh, and one of the odd things that I didn't really mention about this is the fact that sometimes with the noise, just random noise out there, you will get more perceptual evidence than is required by the criterion. So that's how you get false alarms. These are the cases where you think there's something out there, even though there isn't. Um, yeah, and kind of what's crucial here um, is number one, the criterion does not change depending on what you're listening to. You just set that internally uh, and then you apply it across the board to whatever comes into your ears. Uh, and then secondly, there's a difference in the means of the two distributions uh, between the signal distribution and the noise distribution. And what we're going to try to figure out next is how to measure the distance between those two means, between the signal mean and the noise mean on this dimension of perceptual evidence. How might we be able to do that? Um, and there's kind of a clue in these diagrams because the uh, dimension is labeled here in terms of standard deviations from these means. Um, I thought there was something else I wanted to say about this, but I don't think there is at the moment. But that's kind of where we're going with this is try to, fig to, try to figure out what this distance is. So uh, again, there's kind of this um, perceptual or just in entirely internal part, which is how we set the criterion. And then there's this signal based part, which is what how different the signal stimuli are from the noise stimuli. So that distance that we're going to try to quantify between the means of the distributions reflects the listener's sensitivity to the distinction. That's a technical term. Uh, and it's a crucial technical term because it's usually the main or most interesting measure we get out of using this paradigm to analyze the results of our experiment. So how can we estimate this distance? I kind of gave you a clue there, but what we're going to do is measure the distance of the criterion from each mean. And to do that, we're going to use z-scores to standardize our distance measures. So we can kind of put them all on a level playing field and link the two of them up. Um, yeah, so because that thing is, that criterion, not that thing, is not supposed to change between the two uh, types of stimuli, we can uh, sort of just relate each type of stimulus to where that criterion is and calculate that distance measure. Um, okay, so in normal distributions, um, we can make that conversion. What we're going to get is we're going to look at these proportion of responses on either side of the criterion and then convert those into z-scores, which we will combine together to uh, create a distance measure between the two means of these distributions. Um, yeah, so we've done this before. The, like I said, there's nothing really new here. We're just applying it in a new way to a new kind of data, uh, which you might get in, say, uh, perception experiments that you run yourself. But for now, we're going to play around with just fake data. Uh, so we'll give you uh, an example of how this works. We've seen this before as well for a normal distribution. Uh, and this is laid out with this 68, 95, 99.7 rule, basically. So if you remember, 68% of the of a normal distribution is going to be within one standard deviation of the mean. And then 95%, which includes the dark blue and the lighter blue uh, distributions. My daughter wants to get in on the action here. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, nope. I may have, my wife may have saved the day. And here she comes. All right, I apologize for the interruption, but uh, it's hard to, you know, keep children in one place if you want to uh, work inside the home, I guess. I don't know. Uh, anyways, uh, that sort of lecture disaster has been averted. We're going to go back to looking at the Z-scores slide now. Uh, and as I was saying, as before I was uh, interrupted, was uh, that this is embodying the 68, 99.7% rule. So we have 68% of the distribution within one standard deviation here. 
uh, 95% within two standard deviations, and then uh, smaller bits over here on the tails to get you to 99.7% within three. Um, oops. Uh, yep. Yeah, so let's say um, this is the uh, first slide I wanted to show you. Uh, let's say we have our criterion right there in the middle of the normal distribution. Um, and then we already kind of know the fact that this is going to leave us with 50% of the distribution on either side because a normal distribution is symmetric. And remember, not all distributions are going to be symmetric. But if we were to do this, um, if the criterion were to land right smack dab in the middle of the perceptual evidence distribution for some type of stimulus, namely, I guess, the signal stimulus, we'd have 50% hits on this right-hand side. And then we wind up with 50% misses on the other side, which is not a great batting average, but you never know what you're going to get uh, in a perceptual experiment. Uh, but that's just an example, right? So in this case, if the criterion is right at the mean, its Z score is going to be zero and it's going to split the distribution into two. So 50% on either side. Uh, I've labeled them as hits and misses, but you can also think of them as 50% um, present responses and 50% absent responses, going back to the labels we used at the start of this lecture. Now, let's say we were to shift the uh, criterion over a bit. So one standard deviation over here to the left. Uh, and we know now how we can split up these proportions based on um, sort of their Z scores from the mean. Uh, so what we're going to do now is start from 50 and then we're going to add this 34% here on the uh, left hand side of the mean within one standard deviation. And what this is going to do is bump up our percentage of hits, right? And it's going to take that percentage away from the misses. This still being one of these um, signal distributions, I guess you could say. So in this case, we know for a fact that our Z score is going to be negative one, right? That's explicit in this diagram. We're just moving the criterion over by one standard deviation to the left. And that bumps up our hits to 84% and our misses down to 15.9%. Um, and then just leaving this bit over here on the left um, in terms of the misses uh, response category. So, right. It's a big boost, but it doesn't really, we're not really worried at this moment about how to get big boosts like this or these specific numbers. What we want to figure out is the translation between percentages like this, which we can read directly off of our confusion matrix or confusion matrices that we gather from our, um, uh, the responses that our subjects give us in the experiment. We wanna be able to translate from these proportions to Z scores like this. Uh, and this is actually pretty close to that matrix we were looking at at the beginning of this example. So if we go back to canned example number one, we had 82% hits and 18% misses, um, which is very close to 84% hits and 15% misses. So in this case, if we go back here, um, and I'll show you how to do the math for this uh, in a second, but in this case, we can assume that the criterion uh, that we're using to split the world up between present and absent responses for this particular type of stimulus in this experiment is pretty close to one standard deviation below the mean of wherever that distribution is on the perceptual evidence scale. Uh, so it's all relative here. We're not like laying this out as like a specific amount of perceptual evidence or anything like that. We're just saying if there's a criterion, if there's a normal distribution for this type of stimuli, it's about one standard deviation um, sort of below the mean of that distribution. Okay, so that's just one example. And as you might imagine, we can just kind of continue with this approach to the analysis. Um, yeah, and here's how we're going to make this uh, conversion. <clears throat> I'm going to lay it out with this sort of notation, which isn't exactly from the text, but uh, it makes sense to me. And hopefully by the end of this, it'll make sense to you too. But when it says um, capital P of hits here, what that means is the proportion of hits that I'm getting out of a certain, for a certain uh, stimulus type. Uh, and because it's a proportion, it's a probability that um, ideally would range from zero to one you can think of it as ranging from 0% to 100% if you want to. But what that will equal is 1 minus the proportion of misses uh, on the other side of this criterion line. Uh, and so P of misses is also going to range from 0 to 1. If you want to think of it as ranging from 0% to 100%, that's fine too. Uh, but in that case, you have to change this 1 to 100%, basically. Um, yeah, and the other part of this is because things are symmetrical, um, 
in the normal distribution, then the z-score calculations wind up being symmetrical as well. So if I um, do the extra step of calculating the z-score of this proportion of hits, that's going to be the same thing as calculating the z-score of 1 minus the proportion of misses. Um, but it's also going to be the opposite of the z-score of just the proportion of misses. They trade off with one another, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, the uh, I guess I don't know if there's an easy way to uh, lay this out, but I'll just put it out here in terms of the percentages we have on the bottom here. So the z-score of 84.1 which is the z-score of the percentage of hits, uh, is gonna be equal to the opposite of the z-score of the percentage of misses, which is 15.9. And in both cases, they're gonna be equal to one, basically. Um, and if you wanna take the extra step of sort of inserting the percentage of misses here in the middle, um, one minus, or 100% minus the 15.9% is equal to 84.1. It's gonna get you in the same place anyways, and it's gonna give you a z-score of one. Um, yeah, and because we're kind of translating between a graphical idealization of what's going on here and actual numbers that we'll calculate um, to figure out a sensitivity score in the signal detection theory paradigm, I'll just say if your criterion is to the left of the mean, you're going to get a uh, bigger proportion of hits here than 50%. And if that's the case, then your z-score will be positive, even though I've sort of shifted it over here to the left where it's giving you negative numbers. If the z-score, if the proportion is bigger than 50%, the z-score winds up being bigger than zero, basically. And if your uh, proportion is less than 50%, then you get a negative z-score. Um, so you can kind of think of it, I guess, more in terms of what's to the left of this criterion than what's to the right. That might be an easier way to sort of make the graphical uh, conversion in your head because um, negative one here translates to 15.9% of the distribution. Okay, hopefully I didn't confuse you too much with that, but the kind of punchline here is that we're going to calculate a quantity known as D prime. It's a measure of sensitivity uh, and it's uh, the D is, I think, supposed to represent the concept of distance. And then prime is just this little notation we put there to, I guess, say that, you know, this is something we're estimating. Uh, but it's supposed to represent the perceptual distance between the means of the present and absent distributions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and we're going to express this perceptual distance in terms of z-scores, uh, as I've alluded to multiple times here. Uh, so what we're trying to estimate here is the distance between the means of the noise and the signal distributions. And I think I've got that explicitly laid out here. I'm gonna call the mean of the signal distribution uh, mu sub s, and then the mean of the noise distribution will be mu sub n. And I just wanna calculate that distance and it's gonna be um, called d prime. Uh, that's how I'm gonna label it. So that's what it's supposed to mean in parametric world. Uh, but there's also just kind of, you know, a basic interpretation you can get from the response data you collect from your experiment to what z-scores you calculate from those. Um, okay, so here we are looking at the same diagram on a different slide. Uh, but what we're going to do here is we're basically going to combine the z-score for the percentage of hits, which is everything in the signal distribution to the right of this criterion. And then we're going to uh, subtract from that uh, the z-score for the percentage of false alarms. So we're looking at everything over here on the right side of this criterion. So there's a certain proportion of the signal stimuli which will fall on this side and those will be your hits responses. And then there's gonna be a certain proportion of your noise stimuli which will fall on this side of the criterion and those will be your false alarms um, responses. And the measure of D prime is just gonna be the z-score of that proportion of hits minus the z-score of the proportion of false alarms. Um, yeah, so that will give you sort of the combination of these two distances. And like I said, the signages here get a little confusing if you'd rather think of it in terms of uh, correct rejections and misses that would work as well. Um, you just have to kind of flip the signs around a bit. Uh, but if this is working in the way you'd normally expect it to, your proportion of hits should be bigger than your proportion of false alarms. Uh, in really extreme cases that might not work that way if people are just random, not even randomly guessing, but kind of guessing noise more often than signals, something like that. Uh, but normally this proportion would be bigger. Uh, and all we want to do is kind of just figure out the Z scores between the criterion uh, 
and the mean for each of these distributions, uh, and then combine them according to this equation, and we'll get a measure of that overall distance between the two means. And again, we're talking theoretically here, and it might not be super easy to understand. So I'm gonna give you a few examples based on these canned data examples that we got from the text. So uh, yeah, P of H here just represents the proportion of hits, which is 82%. And then P of FA here just represents the proportion of false alarms. Uh, sorry, this is the proportion of false alarms. This is the proportion of correct rejections. Actually, that's a rookie mistake and I'm kind of glad I made it. Uh, so uh, you kind of normally get into the mode of thinking in terms of these correct responses, um, but uh, that's not what we want to look at here. As I gave you that example before, like the number of, the overall number of correct responses you can get hits and correct rejections. They can stay the same even if the bias shifts around. Um, but uh, in order to kind of exclude I, uh, bias from the situation altogether, you want to just look at what's on one side of that criterion line, uh, looking at only one response type to calculate this measure. And then we're going to calculate bias in a different way um, separately after we get through some examples of how to calculate D prime first. Um, yeah, so we're only looking at this side, the criterion. Um, and so what we're going to get there is sort of uh, how well the difference in proportions between the two distributions on that side of the criterion. Uh, if we look at just how many hits there are and how many correct rejections there are, we can't get a sense of that because we're crossing the criterion. And that's why we don't want to just look at the two proportions of correct responses, sorry. Um, so, but look, by looking at sort of the difference in sort of the overlap here, uh, in terms of how much of each of these distributions falls on that side of the criterion, we can get a sense of how far away they are in, in z-score space. Um, so to go back to where I was before I blathered on about my mistakes, uh, this is the proportion of hits. This is the proportion of false alarms. I calculate the z-scores for both of those guys. So I want the z-score of 82%. How much of a proportion of that distribution would that be? Uh, or rather, if I have 82% of that distribution, how does that convert into a z-score? And it turns out to be about 0.915. Um, remember I said it would probably be pretty close to one, and it is, it's 0.915. And then I will look at um, if I have 46% of the absent distribution over on that side of the criterion, uh, what is the z-score of that? Uh, like I said, it's below 0.5, so it's gonna be negative. And it's only negative 0.1 because it's still pretty close to um, 0.5. So I take 0.915, subtract, negative 0.1 from that, that winds up being adding 0.1. So I get 1.015. They're about one z-score apart from each other in perceptual evidence space in this case. Uh, okay, like I said though, we have overall 136 correct responses here. We can also look at the other uh, set of data which has equivalently 136 correct responses. And I do the same math. So again, I'm gonna look at these two guys right here, uh, the 55 and the 19, these are my hits. These are my false alarms. Uh, remember, hits just responding present when I hear an actual signal in the signal. And then uh, false alarms, I hear, I respond present when there isn't a signal in the signal. Uh, and I just convert the math this way. I take the Z score of 55%, which is 0.125. It's just over one because it's just over 50%. And then I take the Z score of 19%, which is going to be fairly negative. It's negative 0.878. Uh, I subtract the one from the other and I get a total, or yeah a sum, I guess, of a difference of 1.003. So they're both about one z-score apart from each other, which is fair because they're both, um, they both have the same overall percentage of correct responses. So that's kind of what sensitivity is representing there is how, you know, in general, what percentage of correct responses can you expect to get out of the uh, stimuli you're listening to? Uh, yeah, so, what that doesn't show us though, is this shift in bias that I mentioned before. So up here, we've got more present responses. Down here, we've got more absent responses. Um, before we get into how to quantify that, I'll just mention there's no absolute meaning to the value of D prime. Um, so it's supposed to represent um, distances along that perceptual evidence scale, but it's not something absolute. It's all relatively defined, right? Because we're converting from proportions into Z scores. 
Uh, in theory, a normal distribution can stretch out infinitely. Its tails can go from negative infinity to infinity on both sides, but you're gonna get pretty close to zero pretty quickly once you get past like about three or four standard deviations from the mean. Uh, so you're not likely to get huge D prime scores if you actually use this approach to analyze your data. Uh, if you get uh, a Z score of, you know, bigger than one, it's, it's pretty substantial, I guess you could say. Uh, at the very high end, you'd probably expect three or four, um, but those are not super common. Uh, you can also think about this a, a bit in terms of that effect size measure, Cohen's D that I was talking about before. So we have on the one hand Cohen's D, and now we have D prime. Um, but if you remember for effect size, like 0.8 was supposed to be a pretty big effect size. Um, and that's not even as big as the D prime scores we're getting here. So once you get one standard deviation apart from each other, that's a pretty healthy uh, D prime. Um, yeah, but uh, there's nothing absolute about it. When you run, you can, you know, calculate D prime scores for like two different samples of, you know, conditions in a perception experiment or something like that, and then run a t-test based on all the D prime scores you collect from different subjects. You may, in fact, wind up doing that for homework pretty soon. Um, but uh, you're in that case, you'd just be making relative comparisons between the two samples. Uh, the actual specific values of D prime are not that important. Um, yeah, but basically bigger means, you know, they're more distinctive and smaller means they're less distinctive from one another. Um, and what I mean by distinctive is it's harder for the listeners to sort of pick out the two different stimuli types from each other. Um, all right, I've got a note here. Because like I said, I first came up with these notes when I was uh, still in Excel world like 20 years ago. Uh, and if you are, are working in Excel, there's a function called norms inv, which can convert uh, percentages to z-scores. In R, you can use the qnorm function. It'll do just the same. Um, and I'm going to give you a homework about all this, and you'll be using uh, R to do it. So you can kind of focus on these commands for now. Um, but that'll also teach you a few other skills as well as we go. Um, a few other caveats about this, like once you get to this point, once you know how to calculate D prime from a um, matrix like this, it's, it's pretty mechanical, it's pretty straightforward. There's a lot of assumptions, like I said, that go behind the scenes um, for this calculation. You don't really have to think about them too much um, as long as you understand basically how the math works to get you this sensitivity score. Like I said, you can just kind of do it mindlessly at some point. But eventually you might run into some difficulties when you hit the limits of the system. Um, and one of those limits is that the Z score is undefined at 100% and 0%. Uh, but that doesn't mean you won't wind up with perceptual data sometimes where you get like 0% scores correct or 100% scores correct or what have you. Uh, so one way to fix this um, which I believe is mentioned in the text is that you can replace those perfect or totally imperfect scores with a minimal deviation from the limit, usually uh, half of the smallest possible unit. So like 0.5% or 99.5%. So the reason we're doing this is like, let's look at uh, this example data uh, where we had 100 stimuli that were present stimuli and 100 stimuli that were absent stimuli. And let's say uh, in this experiment, the subjects got the percentage of hits like absolutely correct. They got every single one, 100%. And then they got 0% misses for the same reason, right? Um, so, you know, in theory, it would have been possible for them to get like 99% of the hits, right? And then 1% of the misses. Uh, so to kind of distinguish um, this fix from that minimally successful case, what we're gonna do is just um, tweak these numbers a little bit basically halfway to the worst case scenario uh, so that it, we can still distinguish it from that one. And we're going to say, well, instead of 100% correct, let's just pretend they got 99.5% correct. And then instead of 0% misses, let's say they got 0.5% misses instead of that. So we're going to wind up with a fixed data set that looks like this. And then we're going to just use this to calculate D prime. So it, this is, yeah, this is not totally exactly representative of what our data are telling us because we're patching up the data a little bit. Um, but the difference, uh, well, basically we can't calculate D prime if we have 100% or 0% at all. It's just the math won't work at all. So we can't really know or exactly say what sort of D prime score we get from this. But uh, this, fix is not going to change things that dramatically. Let's say it's 99.9% .9 and 0.1% or something like that. It's still going to be in 
fairly in the neighborhood of uh, what this calculation will give us, but this one will still give us a bigger D prime than if we had 99 here, um, as opposed to you know 98 or something like that. Uh, so we'll just calculate this as our percentage of hits. This is our calculation for percentage of false alarms. Uh, and if you run the math on that, you wind up with a D prime score of 1.99. So again, that's that's bigger. That's more of a perceptual distance than we got before because it's about two standard deviations. Um, and it, maybe it's a little bit funny, right? Because it looks like maybe there isn't that big of a difference as we saw before because we have, uh, what is this, about 27, 27 and a half uh, of a difference between uh, the number of hits and false alarms. So this would be 36 units, 55 minus 19 is 36, or 82 minus 46 is also 36. So uh, in raw terms, these are bigger differences between these numbers. Uh, but remember, the um, normal distribution is not linear. So even though this is, um, in its raw terms, smaller, because we're getting out to the limits of the distribution here at 99.5, uh, that counts for more, basically, in the D prime calculation once you get out to those tails. So uh, we're winding up with a D prime score of about 2 here, which is bigger than the D prime scores we got before because um, we can distinguish between these two stimuli types better, even though on the surface it looks like we're not doing as well. Um, I will also point out that we do not normally deal with sets of responses that total to 100 in our experimental data. If you have a setup like that, then that's great. Uh, it's going to make your life mildly simpler. Uh, and in fact, probably won't make your life that much simpler at all because you're probably going to wind up just having the you know computer do the uh, math number crunching for you anyways. Uh, but one thing where that might cause some difficulties is if you have to apply this fix to it uh, and you don't have stimulus numbers that total 100. Uh, give me a second here. Uh, so instead of um, having perfect scores that um, are sort of like a half percent, of 100 what we're going to do is we're going to replace the zeros and the 100s with just a half response unit above above or below the minimum and maximum score so let's say uh, instead of having uh, 100 present stimuli we had 20 present stimuli and then the listeners got all the hits perfectly correct they got every single one of them uh, what we'll do here is um, go down by about half a unit for uh, the number of hits, so we'll knock that down to 19.5. And then for the zero misses, we'll just bump that up uh, by half a unit for 0.5. And you don't really even need to worry about the misses here. We're just gonna bump that down to 19.5, and this is our set of false alarms. So we can run the math um, with those numbers. 19.5 uh, translates into a percentage of 0.975. So 19.5 divided by 20 is 97.5%. 6 divided by 20 is 30%. So you just plug those numbers in here and you get a D prime of 2.48. <clears throat> and again, uh, so raw terms of 19.5 minus 6, you shouldn't even be thinking in those terms because what we're really doing is uh, calculating percentages here. And this percentage is pretty big. So 97 point, or percentage difference is pretty big. So 97.5% minus 30% uh, straddles that sort of mean area and it gives you a pretty large uh, D prime of about 2.5. So this is the biggest D prime we've seen so far, but when you get perfect uh, responses like this, um, that can happen, right? Um, I guess I'll mention here as well, just a general principle of running perception experiments is that uh, usually it's not a great thing if your listeners are getting perfect scores on your perception experiment, because uh, if that happens, they're kind of not, not really giving you that much useful information. They're just showing you that they can do the task perfectly right and you don't know why things might ever break down um so there's lots of ways i i guess the way to put it is um you usually get more yeah i'll put it in sports terms which is that you you learn more from a loss than you do from a win uh so if you keep beating the same team over and over again uh you're never going to sort of have to face up to your own mistakes uh and the same applies to um perception experiments like once you've start making mistakes uh, then you can start to see some of the interesting things that go wrong in people's heads when they're trying to perceive speech um, out there in the real world because uh, they don't get it right every single time, even though normally we understand each other pretty well. 
Uh, and that's why people do things like add noise to stimuli um, so that you can't hear the sounds um, that are out there. Uh, and people start making mistakes. You can just see how often they make mistakes in specific conditions. So you can try to figure out um, what's happening to make the mistakes happen. Because what happens to make the mistakes happen is what happens to make the hits happen when they go right as well, is usually the assumption that gets made, right? All right, so enough of the philosophy, enough of the sports. We can talk about other elements of this paradigm, uh, namely how to calculate bias. So um, with bias, um, there's different ways to quantify it. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you actually one way that the, the text this prefers for reasons that uh, I've never totally been on board with. Uh, I'm going to give you a measure which I find as simple and and as intuitive as possible. And like I said, we're only kind of getting a basic introduction to this system anyways. So uh, let's go with kind of the easiest way to understand it and roll on from there. Uh, but the way we're going to define bias is, again, in terms of uh, z-scores along that perceptual evidence um, dimension. So uh, the way to think about it is that if we have an unbiased criterion, that should fall halfway between the means of both distributions. So if, for instance, we had no bias, and I'm going to represent that with a lambda sub u, which means unbiased, <coughs> then our perception, our percentage of hits should equal our percentage of correct rejections. And if you um, can't imagine that readily, uh, I'll just show you what that would look like. So we'd have a criterion here, halfway between our noise distribution and our signal distribution. And we'd split the two right in half like that. Uh, and so our percentage of hits over here would wind up being exactly the same as our percentage of correct rejections over here. Um, isn't that nice? But what we normally get is not that ideal situation. Um, normally, the um, listeners we test are biased in some way or another. Uh, here's an example of what might happen if their uh, criterion was shifted a little bit closer to the noise mean uh, and further away from the signal mean. <clears throat> what would happen there is that you'd get more hits and fewer correct rejections. Incidentally, that would translate to like more hits and more false alarms uh, than we had before. Uh, but remember, it's not totally linear here, so we can't just go straight from, you know, uh, percentages to Z scores. We have to use that. Um, sorry, I, there's no linear relationship between the percentages and the Z scores. So really, the ideal criterion is here, which minimizes our mistakes on both sides. Uh, anything beyond that is going to bump up the number of mistakes we make overall. That's the point I wanted to make about the nonlinearity of this. But anyways, I'm going to label this as lambda sub B. Uh, it's the biased criterion, and it's over here a little bit. Uh, and this distance between the unbiased criterion and the biased criterion, it, we're going to call beta, uh, which is the distance in z-scores between those two criteria, or criterion lines, I guess you could say. Um, yeah. So this unbiased criterion is a spot that gives us the minimum number of mistakes, which is these two numbers down here, these two proportions down here our misses and our false alarms. Anytime we move away from that spot, we're going to overall bump up our number of mistakes. So in um, that particular case where we have a bias criterion, the, what's under the blue line here is our false alarms and what's under the pink line over here is our misses. But the way we try to quantify where that criterion is is by trying to figure out how far away that is from that unbiased criterion. Uh, so we're calling that beta. It's a representation of bias. And I'm not gonna walk you through a derivation of how to calculate that. I'm just gonna give you the equation here. It's equal to negative one half times the Z score of the proportion of hits plus the Z score of the proportion of false alarms. And all of this gets added up before you multiply it by the one, negative one half. Okay, so before we have the Z score for hits, minus the z-score for false alarms. So it was a minus in here. In this case, we're adding them together, but then multiplying them by a negative number. So this is a lot of just plopping stuff in your lap uh, without understanding it from the ground up, but it might be easier to understand it um, with a graphical example. So let's say our d prime score is two. So the distance between the mean of the noise distribution and the mean of the signal distribution is two standard deviations. So that's a pretty healthy effect size, right? Uh, if we have an unbiased criterion, 
<clears throat> it would be exactly one standard deviation away from both means. So, you know, if this is baud zero, this is one, this is two right here, right? Uh, and like I said before, that's gonna minimize the number of mistakes we make, which is the proportions on either side, uh, basically the wrong side of this criterion, pink over here, blue over here. Okay, um, so that's one, that's negative one, and you add them up, you get two. Uh, in this case, the uh, proportions of hits would be 84% um, approximately, and proportion of false alarms would be about 16% approximately, and that would minimize our um, overall mistakes to about 32%, right? Uh, because in the unbiased scenario, our proportion of hits is equal to the proportion of correct rejections. Uh, if we calculate bias in that case, we use this equation, the z-score of the proportion of hits is gonna be one. We're gonna to add to it the z-score proportion of false alarms, which is negative one. These two things add up to zero, and if we multiply that by negative one half, we get a bias score of zero. So like I said, I think this is the easiest way to understand bias. And the reason why is because we get intuitive measures like this, where we, when we have an unbiased criterion, our bias measure is zero. Now, my child is suffering downstairs. Uh, yeah, all right, so hopefully that won't last too long. Um, but anyways, let's move our criterion over half a standard deviation and see what happens to our numbers. So we're moving away from the unbiased spot, which is right here in the middle. And we're moving over half a standard deviation this way. Uh, so first of all, what does that do to our proportion of hits? We know the z-score is gonna be 1.5 for that measure there. And then our z-score for the proportion of false alarms will be negative 0.5, because that's the blue line over here on this side. Um, and then if we, convert that those proportions into numbers, uh, if we can convert those z-scores into proportions, then we get a proportion of hits which is 93.3% uh, before we add 84%. And then if we calculate the proportion of false alarms, we get a total of 30.9%. That's how you convert a, a z-score negative 0.5 to a proportion. So before we had about 16% for those, right? Um, so at this point, what we see is uh, before we had a total number of misses of about 32%, which is what you get when you uh, add 16% to 16%. Now we have thir about 31% false alarms. The number of misses is gonna be almost 7% because it's 100 minus this number. So we have about 7% plus 31%, that's 38% overall. So we're increasing the number of mistakes overall. Uh, and that means we're going to be decreasing our overall, overall number of correct responses as well. Uh, what That doesn't matter in terms of the bias so much as just to recognize that when you have a bias criterion, you're getting more mistakes overall. Uh, to calculate the bias measure here, um, as things stand, uh, we basically take what we know. We have a z-score for the proportion of hits of 1.5. We plug that in here. Our z-score for the proportion of false alarms is negative 0.5. We plug that in there. Uh, and what do we get out of that? We get 1.5 plus minus negative, or we get 1.5 plus a negative 0.5 in the middle here. That adds up to one. And then we multiply that by negative half. That gives us negative 0.5 overall, which I think is a wonderful way to measure this because we know that we move that criterion over a half a standard deviation in this direction in the negative direction, and now we get a bias measure of negative 0.5. Uh, so before, when we were unbiased, we were at zero in the middle right here. Um, that's the minimum number of mistakes. That's equally distant between the two means of the distributions. We're at zero for bias. When we shove that thing over a half a standard deviation, our bias score becomes negative 0.5. Um, so I'll give you some examples of this from the data we've looked at before. Like I said, for these canned examples, the main difference between the two is uh, where listeners are biased towards responding. Um, so in this case, I know this math is a lot, uh, but be thankful I'm not writing it on the board. Uh, so we just take the z-scores for our different proportions, which we've seen before. We plug them into this equation. That winds up being 0.915 plus a negative 0.1 here in the middle. That's um, overall, it's 0.815. Multiply that by a negative half. Actually, I should probably, this is a mess. But these two go together right here. Uh, and that winds up being negative 0.407.
Um, I wanted to mention here, before I do the second example, uh, so this is about the sort of bias we saw in the idealized example just a second ago. It's almost a uh, negative half standard deviation. Um, so that means I'm pushing, come on, that means I'm pushing my criterion over here in this direction about 0 0.407 standard deviations. And when I do that, I increase my number of hits and I increase my number of false alarms too. Right, and you can see that in these comparisons as well. I bumped them up from 84 to 93, from 16 to 31, so on and so forth in this idealized example. And in this sort of uh, going from a confusion matrix example, I bumped up my numbers of hits and false alarms here overall, just because I'm giving more present responses. So more present responses translates into a negative bias in this case. Um, if I go the other way, if I have more absent responses, that means I have fewer hits and I have few, fewer false alarms as well. Uh, and this is just plugging the numbers in and running the math. So in this case, I add up uh, a z-score for hits, uh, which is 0.125, and a z-score for false alarms, which is negative 0.878. Um, if I just run the numbers there again, I wind up with a bias of 0.376. So that is the case where I'm shifting the criterion over to the right and I'm getting fewer hits, fewer false alarms, fewer hits, false alarms, or fewer present responses translates to a bigger bias score, a more positive bias score. Um, yeah, so the higher the criterion for evidence is set, the more positive the bias number will be. So if you can think about it in those terms, um, if you have a higher criterion for how much evidence you'll accept before you uh, respond present, then you will get fewer present responses overall, right? If you're sort of uh, not as strict about it, if you'll accept more or less anything, you get more present responses. Uh, you have a criterion which is set at a lower number, basically. So that's why this is negative. Uh, usually when I run these experiments um, and I calculate bias, I have to stop and sit and look at the confusion matrices and try to remember what hits and false alarms represent uh, before I can figure out what positive means. Uh, in my bias numbers and what negative means in my bias numbers. So I'd recommend that you do the same. I, I know you haven't done this before. It's probably a little confusing, but when you get those numbers, when you calculate bias, take a look at it and say, okay, what does negative mean here? And what does positive mean here? Uh, and then give an interpretation of your bias numbers on the basis of uh, what you figure out from that, I guess I would say. Um, okay, that's all I'm gonna say for now. I have a few examples from real life experiments where I've applied this measure. Uh, but um, that's all I've got for how the basic signal detection theory paradigm works. Um, so I'm going to save the rest uh, for a short video to end this one, uh, and I'm going to call it for now. Uh, keeping in mind that what will happen with the next experiment or examples is that uh, I'm going to base a homework on them. So make sure you understand how all this math works and at least the general principles behind the um, paradigm itself uh, so that you can apply it to real life data uh, for homework here in the future. All right, I'll see you again in just a minute.